All right, welcome back to our Faith and Revelation class. And we're on our final two chapters. Again, uh, went ahead and combined them together. It says 13 and 14, but it's actually 12 and 13. Those are the last two chapters of this semester's class on Faith and Revelation. And again, when we talk about Revelation, we're just talking about the way God reveals Himself to us, right? And then faith is, is our response to that revelation. God, the ways in which God makes Himself known to us, and, uh, yeah, reveals himself. So we're looking again at, at the end here. We're talking about sacred scripture again and just kind of... So sacred scripture in the life of the church is chapter 12 and then answering the challenges that are out there to divine revelation. And, and so the, the criticisms that people would put forward towards the ways in which God reveals himself or, of course, you know, is there even a God? Those kinds of criticisms and stuff. We'll talk about how to respond to some of those here at the end of this as well. Okay, So when we talk about the scriptures, which we've been talking about a lot this semester, right? Um, I think one of the things that it's important to know is that sometimes they're studied, like in college classes or high school classes even, the Bible is studied as literature, Right? It's studied as, as uh, you know, a window. People will say, you know, we want to look at the, the Genesis story as a, as a, as a piece of literature, like, like we might look at you know, To Kill a Mockingbird or any of the other stories that we might study in a, in a setting, uh, th- those great works of literature. Sometimes the scriptures are studied in that way, and that's, that, that, that could be okay because they are good, great pieces of literature uh, in many ways. But I think sometimes that gives the impression, and some people even take it to the next step, to say that it's just a piece of literature. That's the only reason that the book of Genesis or the book of Luke was written, you know, or any Old Testament or New Testament. And the, the answer to that is very clearly, as Catholics, we believe, no, that's not the case. They're not just pieces of literature. The Bible isn't just a collection of stories, right? The books of the Bible are literature. There's poetry and history and all that kind of good stuff. But the books of the Bible are also a personal encounter between you and God. Right? We believe that the scriptures are alive, that they speak to us, that they convey truth and meaning. And not again, not any liter- to kill a mockingbird you know, could convey, conveys truth and it conveys meaning and all that kind of stuff. But To Kill a Mockingbird, when I pick up and read To Kill a Mockingbird, that is not a personal encounter between you and God. It's not not a guarantee that when I read To Kill a Mockingbird, God's going to speak to me in a direct and clear way with every word that I read. That is the case in the scriptures. And that's what makes it totally different. So it's not just a piece of literature, right? God will speak to you through the scriptures, Right? God will speak to you through the scriptures. And it's super important to believe that, understand that, and realize that. A lot of people cry out to God. They want to hear God. They want to talk to God a lot. But they don't go to where God says, I will speak to you at, which is, first and foremost, through an encounter with the sacred scriptures, with the Bible. Okay? So, that, again, really important to understand that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. When we get into this question... Of literature and, and how to interpret. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's try that again. When we get into this question about how to interpret the Bible rightly, that, that's the question that comes up then when we start talking about it as literature, but also then as, as conveying truth and conveying um, God, conveying Himself to us as a people. The question comes, how do, we, how do we interpret the Bible in the right way? And so one of the things that we really need to make sure we remember when we're reading the scriptures is that there's a unity to the scriptures. That's why it's all grouped into one book. Okay, That's why it's called the Bible. That It's been put together into one place. Originally very different sources, very different... Um, uh, you know, all of these different books and, and places. It was brought together by the Catholic Church into one place because there is a unity to them. There is a unity of the scriptures. Christ is the center and heart of the Bible. Of course, that's why it's right there. It's the the hinge. You have the Old Testament, and then the beginning of the New Testament, there's something new with the Gospels, with Jesus. So it is the center and heart of the Bible. right? 
And so I have to ask myself, one of the things I have to ask is, is my interpretation, as if I'm going through and I'm trying to understand or interpret some passage of the Bible, I need to ask, first of all, is it in harmony with the rest of Scripture, right? And is it in harmony with Christ? One of the ways this comes up is I, I, I come across a section or a, a passage, a chapter, a passage of the Bible, whatever it might be. And I wonder, is this literal? Is this literally true? You know, does God literally get angry, right? Um, am I literally supposed to cut my eye out? Those kinds of questions, right? Um, am I literally supposed to sell everything that I own? All these kinds of questions, we are, it's a really important one. We, I need to know, how do I interpret that? So I have to ask myself, first of all, is it in harmony with the rest of Scripture, right? And is it in harmony with Christ? That's one question. Then I also have to ask myself, is my interpretation consistent with sacred tradition? Which we're going to talk about more here later as well. Is my interpretation, or what I'm thinking about is possibly being there, is it consistent with how the church has always interpreted that passage? Most of the passages of the Bible have had many, many commentaries on it done by saints, by popes, by lots and lots of people, right? Lots of the passages of the Bible are referenced in the catechism or in papal documents or in, in lots of other places, right? Documents, writings of the saints. So I can, and if you ever need help with this, there's great places to, to look it up on, online, you know, just searching for Catholic interpretation of and type in the passage that you're struggling with or you want to know, right? You can always ask your priest, right? How, hey, Father, how do I interpret this passage? You know, I came across it. I have questions about it. Could you send me anything? Is there any resources that you might have for help me, helping me understand this passage more? And also, of course, does my interpretation contradict some other truth of the faith? And if that's the case, then I can also know that my interpretation is wrong, right? That I, if, if my interpretation is contradicting some, some other truth of the faith, then that can help me know that I'm, I'm going down the wrong direction with the wrong interpretation. I think a question that we get a lot with regard to sacred scripture and all of these things is, do Catholics know the Bible? And I think that it's important to know here, I think a lot of times we jokingly um, say, you know, that as Catholics, well, we don't really, we don't know the Bible, we don't know where, you know, we don't, maybe don't read the Bible, that kind of stuff. But I, I think it's important to know that, like, quoting scripture chapter and verse is not something that Catholics typically do. It's not part of our tradition or culture to stand up and say, you know, Philippians 2, 4 says, or, you know, J John 3, 12 says, you know, <clears throat> none of those kinds of things are really part of our tradition. There's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with standing up and saying John 3, 12 says this, or Philippians 2, 4 says this. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But I think it's also important that we take the Bible, as we were saying earlier, in its entirety and not just focus on some verses of the Bible, right? When I listen to Protestant preachers on the radio sometimes, it seems like they're, each of those preachers has kind of their favorite passages that they are always referencing, right? So they're always, or every other sermon, you know, they're talking about, you know, uh, you know Luke 4, 8, or, you know, we as Catholics, I think, take a very holistic approach. We read the entirety of the Bible, and so we don't typically go in a lot of times and just pick out particular verses. Because we've seen that get people into trouble. Through the 2,000 year history of the church, people who go in and just liked, particularly people who like certain verses and all the time, right? Because what happens is you can begin to read that, you can begin to build things off of just particular passages of the Bible. You can kind of start to build your religion and build your worldview build your relationship with Christ just on particular passages. And so I think it's really, a lot of times the reasons Catholics shy away from this is we tend to try to read the entirety of the Bible and not get overly focused on any particular verse of the Bible. Again, it's a good thing to know our Bible. And if you like memorizing those kinds of things, that's not a bad thing. And that can even help us in our discussions with non-Catholics when we know precisely where we might find a particular passage, right? But I, I also think we, we, we don't memorize chapter and verse a lot of times 
because I think scripture is, is infusing everything that we do. And I would like to particularly look at the mass here for a minute, right? It's important to know that every word of the mass, almost literally every word, except like the homily and the petitions, basically every other word of the mass is the Bible. It's passages, verses from the Bible. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that's from the Bible. Jesus says, I want you to baptize everyone in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you is in the Bible all the time, right? And with your spirit is in the Bible, lots of places, right? The glory to God in the highest is, is, in, is scripture, right? It's the, it's the hymns that the angels sing in heaven. The first reading is scripture. The psalm is scripture. The second reading is scripture. Alleluia is scripture. The gospel is scripture. The holy, holy, holy is another song that the angels sing in heaven. It's in scripture. The Eucharistic prayer that we use at Mass, whichever one we're using that week, is just almost completely phrases from scripture put together into one prayer, right? Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. That's Scripture. That's St. John the Baptist. The Our Father is in Scripture. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof is Scripture. Go in peace is Scripture, right? All of it at the Mass is Scripture. And so just it's, it's important to know that I think that sometimes well, I don't stop in the middle of the Eucharistic prayer and say, you know, John 4, 9 says, we just say it, right? We don't begin Mass by saying, you know, Luke uh, chapter 22, verses 1, Jesus says, in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. No, we just say it, right? And so I think, unfortunately, a lot of times Catholics just think, oh, we're just there mumbling the phrases at Mass because we know them and we say them all the time. No, we're saying Scripture, right? And so please know that I think it's important that that entire hour of Mass is basically Scripture from beginning to end. And it's easier that way in some ways to just become part of who we are. And I always remember my grandmother, when she was dying about five or six years ago, uh, my parents were telling me how she, I wasn't able to be at her deathbed, but that at, at, at her death as it was approaching, she was just saying the words of the Mass that she had heard her entire life. Parts of the Mass, right? Scripture is sort of infused into our lives if we know that, if we believe and know that what we're doing at Mass, all those words that you could recite from memory at Mass is Scripture. So we, we, we have a lot of Scripture in the church, and I think a lot of times people don't realize it or know it. A great quote about, as I, as I try to encourage you here at the end to have a great relationship with Christ through the scriptures, to be a person who's reading the scriptures on a daily basis and praying with them on a daily basis, even if it's 10 or 20 minutes a day is the, at most, you know, that, that, that's all you can do, that's great. St. Jerome said this, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, right? Ignorance, of, that's a, such a powerful, powerful quote. If you want to know Jesus Christ, you have to know the scriptures and you have to be a person who's in them and knows them well, and is reading all of them, not just parts, not just passages, not just a little calendar that's got a little quote for the day, but diving in with a Bible, reading that, praying with that, saying, Lord, what are you speaking to me as we read these scriptures? Okay, that, Remember that quote from St. Jerome. I think that says it all. Ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. Okay, All right. Moving on here, as we keep looking at scripture, this is a quote from the Catechism, paragraph 2653. The church forcefully and specially exhorts all the Christian faithful to learn the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ by frequent reading of the divine scriptures. Let them remember, however, that prayer should accompany the reading of sacred scripture so that a dialogue takes place between God and man. That says it all right there, right? The church forcefully and specially exhorts all the Christian faithful to learn the surpassing knowledge by frequent reading of the scriptures. That's what we were just saying, right? That's from the catechism. I think I just love the way that that's phrased. The church forcefully, is again, in a sense, is like cheering you on and begging you, exhorting you, right? To be a person who is encountering the scriptures and thus is encountering Christ. So please be a person who's doing that, you know? Um, with all the things that we offer at the parish and, and youth group and all that kind of stuff, nothing will take the place. Nothing can surpass you as a young adult picking up a Bible on a daily basis and reading some of that and praying with that. 
Okay, that will set you on a course and will allow you to encounter and fall in love more deeply with Jesus. We've been talking a little bit about interpretation of the Bible, right? And again, just to, to review this here at the end, sometimes people will say, is the Bible literally true? And we've talked about this in other classes, but again, just to keep coming back to this, because it always needs to be talked about, I think, when we talk about Scripture. There are four different senses or ways to read particular passages of the Bible, right? So we have the literal sense, first of all, the fact that the author was trying to convey something in a, in a, in a literal way. There was something that's trying to be conveyed, even if he didn't mean it literally, or, yeah, even if he didn't mean it literally, there's a literal thing that the, that the author is trying to convey. There's an allegorical sense of Scripture. So the way that, that the stories all kind of fit together and some of them foreshadow each other. So there's this allegory, right, that's going on. So, in, for example, we see in Jesus, we see an al allegorically we can read Jesus in relationship to lots of the different stories in the Old Testament where the father, uh, Abraham, takes his son Isaac up to the top of a mountain and is prepared to offer him and sacrifice him on wood. Well, that's exact. Now we read Jesus' story. There's the, the allegorical sense in which Jesus, the Father, God the Father, allows Jesus to go up a hill and be, and be put to death on, on a piece of wood as well, right? So there's all these, these relationships, right? Jesus talks about baptism, you know, being born of the water and, and passing through death into new life. And that's exactly what the Israelites did when they passed through the Red Sea, right? They passed through the water and the Egyptians are drowned behind them and they emerge as uh, people on the other side. So allegory is a really powerful way that's, that's uh, a sense of the scriptures that's present there. There's the moral sense, Right? So pretty much every passage of Scripture is trying to also convey, or does convey, um, what, about what's right and wrong, you know, how to behave, what not to do, what to do, right? these kinds of things, teaching us about morality and the moral rightness or wrongness of something in particular, or lots of things. And then and also we have the, the anagogical sense which is this sense in which this particular passage that I'm reading, how it fits into the overall picture of all of eternity, right? Heaven and, and all of that here on earth, but also expanding into eternity. How does the, so this, I also need to read scripture in relation to that. How does this fit into to those things, okay? Um, again, I've been saying this already, but this is kind of because we're combining the two chapters, so we're kind of repeating this a little bit. But again, if it's stories from the past, someone might ask, why would I read the Bible? And now this might be somebody at school who, doesn't, who isn't a Christian, you know, who's asking you, why, why do you read the Bible? Why would I read the Bible? And the, a good answer to that, yes, Scripture contains past events, but it is the living Word of God as well. It has that completely, that, that thing that sets it completely apart from all other literature, right? It is the living word of God, so God continues to speak to us through the Bible. So that's why, how you could answer a classmate that says, why do you read the Bible, right? Why, do you, are, why are you into these old stories a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, whatever it might be, three thousand years ago? And the answer uh, would be that, again, God continues to speak to me through that, and I, and I feel that, and I experience that. And so that's, and, and God desires to speak to you as well, right? You could tell that to your classmate if they're asking that question. Um, some people will, might ask, why are some of our Catholic beliefs and practices not found in the Bible? And, and that's a good question too, right? We do have things that we do. There's, you know, the, the, the Mass as, as it's celebrated in Brazil, Indiana, or, you know, in, in, in the places all over the world today, Right? You, you might walk into that and say, well, where is this? Where, is it, where does it say in the Bible to do it exactly this way? Right? Where does it say that in the Bible? And, it, and, and the, the, the quick answer is we can talk about where all of the different parts of the Mass come from. And we talk about Holy Thursday and Jesus in the upper room instituting the Mass and the Eucharist. But I'm talking about just the overall celebration of the Mass. You know, where is it that the priest is supposed, there's supposed to be you know, investments and that kind of stuff? Those kind of things, it's important for people to know, it's important for us to know, first of all, as Catholics, so we can help other people know too, that we believe that the Bible is not the sole, the old, it's, we don't believe that the Bible is the only means that God has chosen to hand on the truths 
of revelation, the truths of himself to us, right? We've talked about this a lot. Of course, we believe that there are particularly two vehicles, scripture, the Bible, and the tradition, right? Tradition means to hand on. So we believe that what has been handed on to us, as St. Paul said, what's handed on to us is also of, of great importance and is also ways that we can learn about God. So the Mass comes to us through the centuries, right? It comes to us, it's handed on to us. So we believe and put stock in and, and understand that God is also speaking to us through that, through the tradition. And so I don't have to say, well, where is the exact celebration of Mass in the Bible, right? The, there's lots of things that aren't in the Bible. The word the Trinity is not in the Bible, right? Original sin, that, that word, that phrase is not in the Bible, right? But we have all these things, right? And even lots of people that, that, are, that say they just believe in the Bible will still also talk about the Trinity, right? So, because that, that was something that was hashed out in the early church over four or five hundred years. So, it's not in the Bible that way, the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. And yet, again, a lot of people use that. So, even people that would use words like the Trinity or original sin are also using things that have been handed on to them and are not in the Bible. And I think also, as we've said many times before too, it's just another thing to remember is that Scripture does not cover every scenario, particularly new things that have arisen over the 2,000 years of the church, right? I mean, it, things like in vitro fertilization, is it right or wrong? Well, the church has said that it's always wrong to participate in in vitro fertilization, right? But there's nothing about in vitro fertilization in the Bible, right? Um, nuclear war, right? There, that, that was something that wasn't understood or even imagined really back then in, in the scriptures. Christ, of course, knew that there would be nuclear war, but it wasn't covered in the scriptures because Christ said, look, when the tradition will be able to understand how to respond to this when nuclear war arises, right? And so the church has had teachings about nuclear wars, nuclear weapons, and so forth, but it's not in the Bible, right? But, so, there's lots of things like this. So we, again, just continue to remember that we as Catholics believe that God speaks to us through the Bible and through the tradition of the things that have been handed on to us through both, right? Not just through Scripture. Okay, so your questions for this final class of the semester. There were some two great saints featured, one in each of our chapters. So I just wanted you to look back at those really quickly. One of them is St. Patrick. Many people have, uh, you know, you hear a lot about St. Patrick, but again, it's been sort of... Uh, something that our larger culture just sort of doesn't even know, uh, you know, or they know he might be the saint in, in Ireland, but, you know, don't know much about him or why we celebrate that or why the Irish celebrate that. So the first question, why is St. Patrick, which can be found on page 123, why is he the patron saint of Ireland? If someone asked you that, just read up real quick on his story. It's a really fascinating story about what happened to him and how he was a slave as a teenager and, uh, but eventually came back to Ireland. So why do you think it is that Ireland uh, has St. Patrick as their patron saint? The other saint, number two, saint, who was St. Benedicta of the Cross, right? Who was St. Benedicta of the Cross? She's found on page 114. Uh, there's a really uh, a beautiful, she's a beautiful saint to become familiar with. She was put to death in the Nazi uh, prison camp and um, was a Jew uh, who converted to Catholicism and uh, became a great scholar, and uh, her, her teachings are still uh, celebrated and read and embraced. Number three, if someone asked you, do the Catholics read the Bible literally? How would you answer that question? Do Catholics read the Bible literally? Number four, what is the other means beside the Bible that God has chosen also to use to hand on his teachings? Number five, if someone asked why you read a book with old stories in it, what would you say to them? And number six, what did St. Jerome say about the Bible? What is his great money quote about the Bible, St. Jerome? Okay, so that's all we have uh, for the, uh, this chapter, these chapters, and this semester. This brings our semester to a close. Um, I hope and pray that you're doing well. If there's ever anything that you need, you want to come and talk about some, get some spiritual direction, uh, go to confession, you're wondering, thinking about what you ought to, you know, maybe be doing with your life or what God might be calling you to do with your life. Uh, if there's anything at all that I can ever help with, um, know of my prayers for you. You're at, uh, in a tough age, you know, as a teenager, you're, you're fighting through things and, and uh, the world's a hard place sometimes. And so just again, I want to affirm you and uh, say that you're 
you're in my prayers all of the time and I would love to be able to do anything that I can for you. So please never hesitate to call, uh, email, text, whatever it is. Let me know what you need and I'll drop everything and uh, be there to be able to help you. So um, again, hope and pray that you're, you're doing well and um, know of my prayers for you. Have, have a great week. God bless.